Uh, it's a, bl a big pleasure uh, for us today uh, to welcome Professor uh, Herb Herbert Amory, uh, who is going to uh, give us an, a seminar entitled The Resource Curse, the Challenges of Managing an Economy Dependent on Volatile Commodity Prices. Uh, Professor Amory received a BA in economics from Queen's University in 1988 and a PhD in economics from the University of British Columbia in 1993. He has taught at the University of Calgary since 1993, uh, where he is currently a professor of economics and the program director, health policy in the School of Public Policy. He is also the managing editor of Canadian Public Policy, Analyse de Politique, from, uh, from 2007 to 2012, he was the Svar uh, Professor in Health Economics, which was a joint appointment between the Department of Economics and the Department of Community Health Sciences and the Faculty of Medicine at the University of Calgary. His research interests and publications are focused on economic history, labor economics, and health economics. Herb's research has addressed the rise and fall of fraternal sickness insurance, the transition from private voluntary health insurance arrangements to compulsory government health insurance uh, across the 20th century. Current projects include studies on reform of public health care in Canada. Also, I would like to mention that Professor Emery is our newest uh, research uh, affiliate at the Prentice Institute. Please join me uh, in welcoming Professor Herbert Emery. Thanks for the invitation today to uh, come down and present. Uh, this is my first chance to get to come to the University of Lethbridge. Mostly I know the city by the arenas where my kids have played hockey. Uh, I also want to note that I've always had a lot of envy for the Prentice Institute, and when I read in the media about it being created and what its focus was going to be, the only emotion I had was envy, because it was going to look at all of the interesting questions from the, what I had been working on from economic history. And I've never seen anyone commit resources to studying things like what's happening with prices, what's happening with demography, what about long-run forces. And so it was really exciting that it was set up. and I'm, I don't know why it took me so long to get an invite down because I've been wanting to come for a long time because I think it's a terrific institute. And uh, again, there isn't anything like it studying these kinds of questions. Uh, most policy schools and institutes kind of chase topics of the day like where should we build a pipeline? Uh, how do we make sure we're not bankrupt within five years in healthcare instead of 10? But getting back to something like what's going on with our demographic changes in society, what's happening in global markets with prices of commodities, that's the stuff that we're about to start fighting about in Canada again. Because it's going to be the deeper forces that we're going to have to wrestle with, not the funding issues of the day. Now, a lot of my introduction sort of emphasized uh, the health work I've been doing, which is relatively recent. And it's, the reason it's all there is because that's what I seem to have to keep writing my bios. But prior to that, around uh, 2001, we were headed towards the centennial of Alberta and Saskatchewan being created as provinces. And I thought I'd get ahead of the curve because I thought everyone would be excited about the centennial and we'd do some regional history about what was happening in the long run development of the Western Canadian provinces. And I wrote a bunch of stuff looking at how did uh, the economies evolve around natural resource exports and I found there was zero market academically for what I was writing. So you, it took, I think, eight years to publish one paper Ron Nevo and I have comparing the long-run development of Alberta and Saskatchewan, which grew out of a study we did, could we merge the two provinces today? And the funniest part was we had started out writing saying, uh, we were fighting with these referees that always said Saskatchewan has socialists and they will never develop until they get rid of them. Well, we took so long to publish this paper, we had the re editor telling us, that our paper seemed kind of weird because now Brad Wall's premier and he seemed pretty business oriented so we had to go back and revise everything. The whole story had flipped. So along the way, uh, one of the projects I'd been looking at was just around how do you use natural resources to develop an economy over the long run and in particular when you have a natural resource that you know is someday going to be in demand but isn't currently in demand uh, 
what do you do about it if you want to get a, a jump start on it, or should you not do that? Should you just leave it alone and let the market dictate where you're going to go? So some of this was coming out of just trying to understand oil sands history, a non-conventional resource that someday might be profitable. Governments were pumping a lot of money in trying to figure out how to get markets for it, how to get it out of the ground at a lower cost. And then I was working with one of my former supervisors, Harry Parsh, who tends to be more of an econometrician, and he was looking at optimal royalty regimes for forestry. And in reading a big manuscript he put together, there's this section on the McBride timber licenses, special timber licenses. And it was a couple paragraphs that these things were kind of neat, but they were bizarre because 200,000 people in the province of British Columbia in two years alienated 85% of the cutting rights to timber in the province. So basically the entire province was sold off to speculators, people who had no intention of cutting timber. It's considered one of the most reprehensible, horrible uh, land policies in Canadian history, but because it's so reprehensible, no one studied it. They just said it's awful. Luckily, we got rid of it, and we're still cleaning up the mess. So being interested in this kind of thing, I went back and started looking at it more, and it started to get a bit more interesting because the timing of when they did it, there was no market for BC timber beyond cutting for local needs or trying to get some pulp and paper going. They knew they have a massive resource, and they don't know how to get the revenue out of it. So they came up with a solution that around uh, 1900 to 1905, you have a financial stock market speculative <coughs> boom going, going on in the United States, and it turns out lots of people are looking for assets to hold. And so what the British Columbia government discovers is that people would like to hold cutting rights, an option on cutting timber. So they sell the rights at next to nothing, but they make you pay an annual rental. And so it's the rental fee that becomes the important uh, price, and this is the one that's not generally used in natural resource uh, revenue schemes. We rely a lot on upfront sales at competitive auction. We rely a lot on royalties at the time of cutting. But what was novel about this was the use of rentals on resources that were not going to be produced for decades in some cases. So it becomes interesting to think about, was this a good policy? Was it a lousy policy? What are the lessons learned for if you do have an abundance of a resource that's not currently in demand, can you leverage that to actually make something happen in your economy? And then most people would look at British Columbia today and say it's been relatively successful. And so one of the questions I had was trying to figure out, can we tie any of the later success that British Columbia had to this early period of acquiring capital? Because they did acquire a lot of revenue in a short period of time that allowed them to do things that they wouldn't have been able to do otherwise. And Alberta's had three episodes that are very similar through its oil booms. And as you know, our famous slogan is, give us another oil boom, and this time we promise not to piss it away. <laughs> right. We've started writing papers called Three Strikes and You're Out, because we've now had three swings at it, and the province has yet to actually achieve anything lasting beyond at the end. I'll try and, if I have time, I'll talk about studies we've done on the, the Lougheed oil boom, where you actually see one transformative change for sure, which is just the investment in human capital of the population. And so that's going to be a recurring theme that when you take resource rents and you funnel them into things like human capital formation, you tend to see better outcomes in the long run. When you spend it on things like just having a high level of consumption that's non-sustainable, you don't get anything lasting. And unfortunately, at the current boom, I think we're doing that kind of uh, use of the rents just having no taxes to pay for things, not fully fund to say funding the services we take, but we're not seeing the tangible lasting things uh, that we might have wanted, such as what are we doing with the education system, what are we doing with post-secondary, what were we doing with skills training over the last 15 years. Uh, we just kind of let things go. So we have to start, again, using these kind of historical cases to reminding decision makers that there are things they can do with revenue that do have lasting effects. And even if you don't trust them to make the human capital investments, you can think about Norway. Just take the money and put it in a big capital fund, and then you'll have some revenue that will last in perpetuity. We haven't done that. We've collected probably, what, about $150 billion in non-renewable energy royalties, and we saved about 10% of them. The rest have just gone on. Um, well, we'll come up with a list later. <laughs> so with that as a bit of a... An intro why I was studying this. The title is really trying to capture the two views of this reprehensible land system of uh, alienating timber to speculators because 
in historians' views, speculators are bad, producing interests are good. So I want to contrast that as well before I forget that this idea that I'm not going to cut timber, but I have money and I'd like to hold the rights, I shouldn't be allowed to hold these according to good land systems, but when I'm Imperial Oil and I approach the Tommy Douglas government and I say, give me exclusive rights to exploration in your province, that would be considered a reasonable one to do because that would be a producing interest doing something for the province. And when Douglas tells Imperial, no, we're not going to do that for you, the story is Imperial flees to Alberta, discovers Leduc, and that's why we got the oil capital and not Regina. But again, the story is that we should have had Saskatchewan listening to Imperial Oil as a producing interest who could have done the development for them in an efficient manner. So is it better to let these fragmented speculators run around and pick up all the options and make the companies have to negotiate with them individually? Or is it better just to give the economic interest or the corporation exclusive rights and then hope you can tax them at the end? So there's lots of things you can think about, even uh, if you want to do game theory, how you could sort of break a monopoly hold of a large international capitalist if you suddenly create this entire competitive fringe that they have to negotiate with all those little parties. You could start to see some options there. But with this uh, McBride conservative government's timber licenses, McBride is also notorious because he's the first elected pre, uh, premier of British Columbia. Prior to McBride, they were appointed by the lieutenant governor. And so the timing of this is it's the first elected government of British Columbia in a sense. And they're going to do this amazing land policy that is an abrupt change from everything that went before. So the title, of, part of the title comes from this quote, which comes from the Honorable William Ross, who was the Minister of Lands, uh, justifying what McBride did in 1912 after the whole thing had run its course. But he says it was a moment of danger for the province. It was a parting of the ways. British Columbia was not the first young country that languished for want of capital. It was not the first young country that sought to obtain capital by sale of natural resources. Modern history is full of sad examples of young countries determining a capital at any price at any ruinous sacrifice for the future. In 1905, the ingenuity and foresight of the statesmen were needed to invent a forest policy to meet the situation. So we don't get speeches like this anymore in legislatures. But when you read his whole speech, it's full of this kind of great rhetoric. Uh, basically, you would think that these guys were geniuses, that they figured the whole thing out. But then in 1945, the Royal Commission on Timber, uh, this, I think this is the first one that at the Sloan Commissions. They do two major ones, one in 45 and another one in 56 on what they need to do to fix things. And a big focus is always how do they fix the damage of the McBride special timber licenses? Because basically they wound up with all these people years later still holding these licenses and the government can't even find them to figure out who holds the rights. And it took, I think, 60 years before they extinguished the last one. So it was kind of lasting. But their quote was, to conclude that the earlier settlers who had a hand in framing forest laws and policies of those days were in doing so deliberately thinking in terms of generations ahead, I think with respect to attribute to them an unwarranted prescience. Uh, early administrations were, in my view, motivated by the immediate objectives important to the era in which they lived. They were confronted with the critical necessity of obtaining revenue and of finding a means to encourage the utilization of forest products. So in other words, the take that comes out much later and that you'll see going through forest economists and forest historians is that this is just a cash-starved government that's doing something stupid in order to get money. And if you live in Alberta, you're not often averse to this kind of interpretation. <laughs> uh, I think this is the usual debate in the Edmonton legislature about you're just giving your corporate buddies money, you need to get more money for us. Whereas here we've got a nice debate where in 1905 to 1907 they did something and then years later through the lens of President's focus you're looking back and saying ah oh, they are cash strapped and they messed it up from our perspective now we got to fix it. And so these commissions what they're trying to do is convert how British Columbia collects its revenue away from some of the older methods like these licenses and moving more towards tree farm licenses and selling rights at auction so that you get a competitively determined value of the standing timber. And so what's really coming to the fore after World War II is an emphasis on what you'd call economic efficiency in setting policy. And what's sort of disappearing in a way is a discussion around, what I mean by that I guess is efficient use of the resource as opposed to meeting the needs of the crown. 
uh, efficiency of the use of resource be darned, that kind of thing. So there is a change in focus and what the 45 Commission is really acknowledging is that, yeah, they needed revenue, we understand why they did it, it just wasn't a good idea. And so we want to take that on. And part of being a good economist is trying to come up with something that everyone says is surprising or counterintuitive, so I thought I'd take one more run at it. And by the end, I hope to convince you this was actually quite a clever policy. And when you look at it through the lens of how it was actually working and how much revenue they actually collected compared to the counterfactual had they never done this, it's incredibly, <laughs> it's remarkable what they pulled off. And what was more amazing to me is that no one has studied it. Because it hit, if you really want to get some nice publications, you can find lots of examples like this historically that everyone's ignored because no one reads history anymore. But just bizarre decisions made by a government superficially, and then when you go back and read about them, they actually get quite interesting to think through how did it work. And I can't promise you there's a journal that will publish it, uh, but you'll have fun working on it. <laughs> so what is the dangerous moment for a young resource-rich economy? Well, what you have to think about is you're a small population, you're distant from markets, you don't have a lot of capital around, you don't have a lot of often expertise to do things, and you don't even have administrative machinery to do things like survey land so that you even know what you have. So what you know is you've got this big area and a small population that's largely on the coast, and you need capital to do things. So lacking capital, lacking population, lacking public revenue, with, and resource demand is maybe decades away. If you want to study the oil sands, it's the same story. Uh, how do you acquire capital, spur industrialization, and get settlement? In other words, how do you develop your economy? Well, the first option you have, which is what the Australians used a lot, is you're going to borrow against the future resource rents that you're so optimistic that this is going to work, you're just going to start floating bonds and hope that in future all those taxpayers are going to retire them for you. And so part of what's going to come out when the British Columbians do this is they looked at Australia in the late 19th century and said borrowing against future rents is a mistake. The second thing, you can just give the future rents a way to attract capital. And this is a popular one in Canada. So in Ontario with their forest sector, later with the prairies with farming, Basically what you do is in return for investment in the industry, you give away the resource rights to the producer. So what you require is that the producer and processors of the resource have to invest in a mill or they have to invest in some capacity to produce, which will create jobs and the spin-offs and everything else. So in other words, you sacrifice the rents entirely so that you can transition them into more of an industrial economy. That's been a very popular one to do. Ontario has lots of examples with its pulp and paper industry where you would be given rights to vast tracts of land if you built the pulp mill. And this was typically, they were leveraging American capital, saying that we will let the Americans have this, and then they would put a ban on exporting raw logs to give them an extra incentive to come up and do it. So this is a development strategy. The third one, you can tax the existing population and industries more heavily. So in other words, you try to convince them that we got something good here and if we can all just take more of our current consumption and put it towards investment in the future, you'll all get a return later on. But when you only have about 150 to 200,000 people, you don't have a very large tax base to do much. The fourth one, which economists of late seem more uh, to be more promoting of, is just be patient and wait for demand to emerge and let the market direct the development. So in other words, the 150,000 people who are stuck there with nothing to do, that's their problem. What we really should have been telling them to do is just leave it alone, let the market dictate the pace and place of where things are going to go, and everything will unfold as it should. Right? But this doesn't fit with the psychology of someone who's gone to a frontier, wants to make an investment, and wants to make a profit getting ahead of the uh, market opportunity. So this one's going to be tough to do, and then the fifth one which you don't typically see listed, normally you would only see the first four, sell options on the extraction rights to speculators. And think about Jim Prentice doing this right now. If he could redo the oil sands, he could just say to any Albertan, come on in and you can have the extraction rights to a hectare, and we'll have companies negotiate with you if they want to cut. But basically you transfer the rights to individual holders, and in return I'm just going to pay an annual rental for the rights to hold those. And so this one, because it's not so much the rental payment that people are upset about, it's the inclusion of speculative demand to leverage the future rents into the present. That where a lot of the history of Canadian land policy is about how do you restrain speculation? 
to make sure that, say, farmland gets put towards homesteaders and productive farmers as opposed to people who want to just flip the land. So this is equivalent to giving it to flippers, people who have no long-run interest in the industry. They're just going to hold it, and they're going to try and extract as much profit as they can out of legitimate timber cutters. But because people are still thinking about attracting capital and getting the industry going, this one is going to be seen as damaging for the long-run interests of the industrial development. So are they trading off short-run revenues against long-run economic development, or is something else going on that's not as much of a problem as I'm portraying it? Is that sort of clear so far? So with these licenses, they were only issued for approximately two years. And if you, everyone's been to British Columbia, probably. So you know it's a big area and there's tons of trees. Picture 85% of that province, all the standing timber, is handed over to speculators, the cutting rights, over a two-year period. They don't sell the rights. They basically hand them over for someone who's willing to accept a rental payment. And so 85% of the province, the standing timber, is controlled by about 12,000 licenses to 15,000 license holders. And none of them are necessarily timber cutters. So a lot of them are just going to be Americans. This amounts to 9 million acres, and the population that did this policy was only 177,000 people. So when you talk about reckless government, this is one reason why things like the federal government doesn't want to grant provincial status to small populations. They tend to do crazy things, and it was one argument for why Alberta should never have been a province. So one view was Albertans uh, around 1905 tended to make reckless decisions, and it would be better to have the more mature government in Regina be responsible for the area so that Albertans wouldn't be allowed to make such crazy decisions with their resources. And, and so this is a... <laughs> no. So maybe having that border has been a mistake all along. But Saskatchewan's always been viewed as more responsible as a governing province, and Alberta's been a bit wilder at times. But this one, I don't think you can find a bigger decision than that one, other than maybe Confederation and that crazy dream to build a railway to the plains. Um, and luckily, that prime minister had some drinking issues, so we can understand why that decision was made. <laughs> I got in trouble for that comment at a John A. MacDonald at 2015 conference. Uh, <laughs> the group that's trying to rehabilitate John A. MacDonald's image at the 200th anniversary as a great statesman wants to redefine how he drank. And so, <laughs> he, so I had the paper was provisionally titled A Drunkard's Dream about Western Canada under Confederation. And they were offended by that, so now we have some boring title like John A. MacDonald in the West. But <laughs> apparently, just for the record, the view is he didn't drink constantly, and he didn't drink when he was sitting in the house. He only drank on holidays, and he sort of put it all into a three-month period or something like that. <laughs> so my drunkenness take is not considered accepted widely in the literature. <laughs> they also had to deal with the racist issues and everything else, but the volume's out. It's called McDonald in 2015, and you'll see lots of sort of revisionist views of what he was up to. So how did this work? In return for an annual rental payment, the annual license was a 21-year annual renewable. So you buy the thing, you pay a rental every year, and you can renew it for up to 21 years. And what you're hoping on this stake square mile that you have, so the way this would work, someone would run out with stakes, they would pound them into the ground and make a square mile, and then they would go back to Victoria and report where the square mile was and register it, and that would be the licensed area. And all the timber on that staked mile, <clears throat> the license that you held was the rights to cut that timber. Now, if you're going to cut the timber, you had to have it surveyed and cruised first for royalty purposes. So none of that's going to change. And when the timber's cut, the government reserves the right to set a royalty and change the royalty over time if they want to. So literally all this is, is you hold the rights to cutting and you can sell them to someone. So that you make the rights renewable and you make them tradable and you have the rights to cut that timber and you can transfer them to anyone else who wants to buy them from you. So this just becomes an option or an asset and you don't have to be a timber cutter or a mill license holder which you did prior to 1905. They did have licenses for timber but you had to be a legitimate timber cutting interest and they would never have a renewable period this long because they wanted you to cut sooner. Right. So the idea was to spur development but this one they're going to let the timber sit and they're going to let anyone hold it as long as they're willing to pay a rental payment. Now, 
what's going to happen over time as they get closer to the 21 year period and they've alienated everything over two years is picture the forest liquidation that's about to occur in the minds of the government. So they're already facing depressed timber prices sort of 15 years later and what they're really worried about is that if they force all these guys to give up their licenses at year 21 they're all going to just liquidate the timber holdings all at once and it'll flood the market and everything will be done. So that results in a change where they make it perpetually renewable. And there are still some of these, I think, held today, although this is a question and dispute when I've talked to the Minister, Ministry of Forests in BC. And then some archivists have told me that they've seen in uh, private holdings of Ontario timber families still some reference to holding some of these. So they are still around. They were made uh, perpetually renewable and sellable. They generate considerable revenues for the government at a day and time when export demand for BC timber didn't really emerge. There was no demand for British Columbia timber prior to really the 1920s. And in 1919, H.R. Uh, McMillan, who was the minister of, or sorry, the head of the forest branch, we went around the globe looking for markets for BC timber. And when he came back and told the British Columbia government, we've, there are some markets that we could export to, they didn't act on his decision, so he left the Forest Service and founded the H.R. McMillan Company and acted on his own intel and information, and he eventually got into a large integrated forestry shipping company. But that was also going to be something that's going to be financed out of these revenues, because how else could he have gone around the globe if there's no revenue in the province? So it generates considerable revenue. The forest revenues for the Crown increased from less than $500,000 in nominal terms in 1904 to a steady stream of around $2.5 million per year as late as the 1920s, just from the rental payment on 15,000 licenses. So they basically uh, quintupled their revenues from the forest. They become one of the largest forest revenue provinces in Canada, larger than Ontario, and they're not cutting any timber. So that's a really remarkable thing. The resource isn't actually being exploited, yet they have more revenue from forests than Ontario and Quebec, which are actually cutting a lot of timber every year. It's widely criticized as being costly in the long run in terms of inefficient management of the resource and foregoing long run revenues for British Columbians. So in other words, the interpretation that I'm putting up as the straw man is a small cash hungry population mortgage the future in order to meet some of their own demands. And so then the story going forward through the Royal Commissions and everything else is basically building the case that this was a huge mistake and they've been really great at fixing it all up. And that's how they got to the wonderful position they're into today. So government revenues from forests, the way to think of this is that you can uh, make your revenue in two ways, or sorry, profit can be extracted in two ways. One is holding the standing timber, so there's standing rents in terms of the asset value of the trees. Or you can cut it and sell it to people who want to use it for something. And what we think of most of the time is basically profits from cutting timber. What the British Columbia government faced in 1905 is no one wants to cut it because there's no demand for it. So they want to figure out how do you take advantage of the profits that can be extracted from the holding, holding the timber or the standing value. And so the usual system of selling crown timber is based on three payments. This is true in any regime. The first one is there's a lump sum payment uh, from the sale of secure cutting rights. So in other words, you announce that we're going to open up certain stands for uh, production or for being held, and you can tell us how much you're willing to pay, and as you get into more advanced competitive systems, you want to do this at auction, typically a second price sealed bid type format so that you get everyone revealing their true costs and all that good stuff, no winner's curse. Then the second thing you have, if they're not going to cut right away, this is where the holding comes in. Suppose I dispose of the rights and then the company announces I'm not going to produce for 10 years. Then what you want to have is a rental payment so they have to pay you something for holding it and not producing it because by not producing it and cutting it, you're foregoing the royalty and bonus payments which are paid at the time of cutting. So in other words, when you're, when you're disposing of your timber rights or your mineral rights, you're balancing these three interests. What's the timing you want the production to occur? What's the revenue you want to collect? And how do you make sure that the crown is getting its fair share? So typically in forestry, there's been a big emphasis lately on the lump sum payment up front through timber sales. Certainly in oil and gas markets, when we didn't have markets for Alberta oil and gas, the lump sum payment up front through land auction was an important one.
And then the other one we always think about is the royalty at the time of production. And Ed Stelmack got in trouble because when he saw in 2008, 2009, land sales were declining, the uh, interest in getting a higher royalty cut uh, came to the fore because he needed more revenue and he wanted to get a fair share because this source of getting his rents was declining. Now the new problem for the government, if you think about the oil sands and all the deferred projects and production, is now they're going to have to think about getting some kind of way of extracting the holding profit. Another example from Alberta is that Peter Lougheed in 1972, prior to OPEC, wanted to get a higher royalty rate for Albertans to get more revenue to do what he wanted to do. The oil companies told him he couldn't do that because there was the long-run contract under Manning for the, I think it was a 15% royalty for 50 years. So what Lougheed did that's really one of the most clever political things I've seen in this type of era is he said, that's fine, you can keep your low royalty, but we're going to introduce a holding tax or a rental payment, knowing that this was shut in production. And when he offered them a choice of a rental payment with low royalty or just a higher royalty, they opted for the higher royalty, and then OPEC bailed them all out. <laughs> but when you go back prior to that, it was actually quite clever what he did to get the oil companies to accept the royalty without actually uh, breaking the contract. But it, it's always a tension. How do you balance these three interests? And so then if you want to add in problems now of uh, capital-intensive resource producers today, the challenge is how do you negotiate with international corporations that have a longer game and more places they can go, how you're going to extract the royalties versus the holding rents versus the lump sum payment up front. And then when you go back to you're trying to create jobs and attract capital, maybe it's easier just to give the rents away hope for a low royalty to attract the capital as well. So you become a passive rentier government, and all the while the capitalists are just taking all the rents and they're leaving your economy. So this would be one interpretation of the oil-rich economies today, why they're so poor and fail to industrialize, and why there was a nationalization movement under OPEC, was to try and keep some of that foreign capital income uh, retained in the local economy. So British Columbia is not going to worry about attracting capital in the short run, they're just going to think about how do we use this rental payment to get revenue. So prior to 1905, and they did think about this, they just didn't come up with it out of the blue, the problem with relying on royalties is they don't expect any harvesting to occur for a long time. It could be decades away. So if you need revenue, you can't rely on this, and they know this from experience, that from 1864, when they're set up as a sort of identified colony and they have this optimal land policy trying to restrain speculation and make sure producers get it, nobody's cutting timber in British Columbia other than for local needs. So they're not seeing any revenue coming in. And then the other problem is that, and this should ring true again, everyone <coughs> remember peak oil? That the world was running out and that's why the oil sands would make so much money? Well, the earlier version of this in the 19th century was the timber famine. And the timber famine was, in the late 19th century, Americans were expanding so rapidly, they'd cut all their trees. And so eventually they knew Western North American sources of timber had to come into demand because, like peak oil, Eastern North Americans were running out of timber, and so they would need what we have. And this kind of perception is going to feed into the speculative demand for holding cutting rights in the West. In the United States, they don't use this. They go to more of a tree farm license approach right from the outset. They don't use speculators. So if you wanted to take this and do a comparative study, you could do uh, the northwestern United States, how they were managing their resources at the same time compared to BC. The other speculative fever that's coming in is the Panama Canal, when it opens, is expected to alter demand for British Columbia timber as well, because it's going to open up a new trade route. Uh, similar kinds of fever we're seeing now is opening up the Northwest Passage uh, and the Harper government's interest in developing the Arctic as a throughway, so we're going to get more speculative fever coming in. So with this, the timber famine and the Panama Canal opening up, you know you can't collect royalties in the short run, but you're starting to think ahead. There will be lots of them in the future. Uh, upfront sales are impractical uh, and may <coughs> fail to reflect the future rise in value of the timber. If you think that no one's going to cut for 20 years and you're going to have a competitive auction in 1905, are you sure that the people bidding are going to come up with a price that accurately reflects what the resource is ultimately going to be worth, when you don't actually know what that price will be. And so this one is just considered too risky, and there also isn't a thick enough market to do it in terms of timber cutting interests. So when you go through it and you just do ruling things out, out of the three things, we're only left with one, 
which is rental payments. And this seems to be the logic the government came to. We can't rely on royalties. It doesn't make sense to do upfront sales. And one reason they can't do upfront sales is because they don't have money to survey anything. And to do a sale, you actually have to be able to cruise the stand of timber and figure out an estimate of the standing value so you know what minimum bid you have to require. So in 1905, they don't actually have the infrastructure or capital necessary to do that basic administration to even run this. So they can't do it. <coughs> so they're going to do rental payments. So one of the things I like is that the language of the McBride government seems to predate uh, the life cycle model of consumption. They're talking about using rental payments to convert the standing value of timber into permanent income or interest income earned on the standing uh, timber. So it always catches me off guard when I read something from 1905 that's using terminology I didn't see coming in till 1950s, 1960s in economics and it's considered revolutionary. But it seems like farmers and timber cutters and governments of the day seem to have an intuitive understanding of how some of these things worked. And the uh, amazing thing, if you want to see net present value calculations that are just incredible, go back to some of the royal commissions where these guys with an abacus, I guess, are <laughs> figuring all this stuff out. But they do a better explanation of asset values than I've seen done in most textbooks. Because again, I think they've got these accounting-minded uh, bean counters that are just interested in figuring out how do they get the revenue out of the resource. So Minister Ross, in his 1912 speech where I had that nice quote at the beginning, He's going to portray these licenses as nothing more than a small modification of the earlier license system, but you have to talk about it in those laudatory terms, it's revolutionary. The royalty rate is going to remain the same after 1905, and the right of the, to alter it remains with the crown. So when you sell these rights, there's no promise to them that the royalty rate's going to remain fixed. So in other words, nothing changes on the royalty. You're not giving up any revenue on that. The upfront uh, lump sum payment required, which is mostly a registration fee, is reduced to something like $5. But basically, they're giving the holding rights away to anyone who wants to register it. Uh, what they're going to do instead is they're going to have an annual rental payment of $140 per year, which was a sizable increase on what they had before. And this is going to be on a square mile of staked timber, and they don't care where you stake it, just go out and stake it and register it, and then you hold the rights to that square mile. And because you can sell these rights, the way it's going to work is whoever goes out and does the staking pays the $5 to register it, and then they're going to go into the newspaper or someplace like that, and they're going to sell privately those rights. And so one of the things we've been trying to get, and we haven't found them yet, is we want to find a record of what the private market was uh, paying for these cutting rights, not the stated rate paid by the cruiser or the stakers. And why we wanted to do that was to try and do kind of an option value approach to figuring out where the investors thought the more valuable stands were. Because obviously the things closer to the coast are going to be cut first and might have higher value. But so far a lot of the records have been destroyed. And so it's been very difficult to find them, but I'm treating this as my retirement project in a few years. <laughs> there, are, a, there are rumored to be a stockpile of archive materials with the H.R. Macmillan holdings and maybe in the BC government that might have these prices and then I can spend my dying days manually recording the price of every square mile of British Columbia. <laughs> you can see why I have lots of friends. I do so many exciting things. <laughs> the other thing that's going to happen is that instead of having a five-year limit, so the earliest licenses were only for timber cutters. You had to be someone who was going to cut the timber and to make sure that you weren't a speculator, you could only have five years from the time you acquired the license uh, to cutting, otherwise you had to surrender it. So the idea here was if you didn't cut it in five years, the Crown took it back and they could just give the rights to someone else. So what you're going to see is that people don't pick up licenses until they're pretty sure they're going to cut. And so there's not a lot of licenses issued prior to 1905. After 1905, in addition to it being transferable, it's going to have a longer tenure of uh, 21 years and you don't have to be a timber cutter. You can just sell it. So anyone can hold these, so what they've created is basically an asset. So you own the rights to cut, you can do with them what you will, you can cut yourself, you can sell them. And so basically the other thing that's going to happen as well, which is important after the crash, financial crash of 1907, 
is that if you don't make your rental payments, the timber just, the crown just takes the timber rights back and they can do with them what they want, reissue them or hold them again. So what's going to happen after 1907 is that when a lot of people are in financial crisis, they just stop paying the rental payments and out of these 15,000 licenses, they start uh, converting back to the crown. So the timber's never cut. They've only collected revenue in the short run on the rentals, but it's like a no harm, no foul type thing, but we're gonna have to deal with that when we do our evaluation later. And the rental payments are interpreted by the BC government as interest earned on its resource wealth. So in other words, the trees are not a financial asset, but by having these cutting rights with rentals, what you're creating is effectively an interest payment on the standing value of the timber, which is kind of clever when you think about it. Um, if you follow what's happening right now down in the United States with all these wells that are set up to be fracked, but they don't want to produce them at the low price, they're effectively doing a similar thing now where you can trade the rights to those wells. And people are buying those up and what's going to happen is at some point they expect the price will go up, they'll frack them, produce them, and you get this kind of thing. So we would want to look at the United States if it's trying to get the holding wealth, uh, an interest payment on it through a rental payment or how those rights are being issued. So between 1905 and 1907, 1,500 timber licenses were in force in 1905. There are 15,000 by 1907 when they stop issuing them, and it's for 9 million acres of timber. Now, the debate that comes in is who's holding these, and the claim is made throughout that it's by speculators. And by speculators, what the literature and what the governments mean is license owners who, are neither, who neither logged or owned sawmills but held permits purely for their increase in value. So when we're talking about speculators, we're not trying to suggest that these are evil people. They're just people who want to hold something that's going to increase in value. And this is considered bad in most historic evaluations of Canadian land policy. You have to restrain speculative motives. Um, so again, this smaller quote here is just, the 1945 Royal Commission recognized that what the government did is they created a speculative fever in staking. So there's a staking boom going on, 1905 to 1907, where everyone's running around uh, measuring out where they're, with their chains what the square mile is and registering it. And so what the boom is, is it has nothing to do with production. It's just everyone's going out to stake their claim. It's no different than a mining situation. If you announced gold's been discovered in Lethbridge, you'd have people running around with chains staking their claims around here. And so one way to think of this is that, and one interpretation when I presented this before from someone in the audience is, what's the big deal? It's just a mining uh, revenue regime being applied to forests. And in this period of history, these governments have no interest in replanting and forest is renewable because they got so much of it. So they are actually mining it. So you can think of it in those terms. Now, just to bring in a multidisciplinary perspective, this is literature. Uh, there's a book written around this time by Aladar... I always forget his first name, something like Allardyer Granger. He was a forester that worked with the BC government, but he wrote a novel called Woodsman of the West, which is actually a really interesting thing to read. And he has a description in one of the chapters called Fishing for Suckers during the staking boom. And so his description, which is considered by Wikipedia the authoritative source, to be an <laughs> accurate, accurate portrayal of the British Columbia industry at this early time period, he wrote, now a $10 price for logs had stimulated demand for good logging claims and suddenly it had dawned on everybody that such claims were limited in number and were being taken up rapidly. There had arisen a fierce rush to stake timber. He proceeds, hundreds and hundreds of men, experienced loggers, inexperienced youths from towns, blossomed as timber cruisers. They had staked the good timber and then the poor timber and then the places that looked as if they had timber on them and then the places that lack that appearance. <laughs> so they're staking everything, according to him. What happened in the end, all these claims, I do not know. They were sold successfully, I believe, to vague American interests and to readers of advertisements in Chicago and Philadelphia in the East generally. The catching of the English investor seems to be becoming less of a topical pleasantry in current talk, and I suppose that fishing for suckers nowadays has to be done closer to home. <laughs> so in other words, they're not even selling good claims in a lot of cases. They're selling claims on just anything. And this is what makes it kind of remarkable that they've found out that people just want to hold the cutting rights. They don't even ever come out and look at it. Just as long as they have that square mile and people want to hold it, 
you can think of BREX, you can think of any other speculative boom that's going on. And this is what the government is exploiting. They're not just letting the private market make the money on it. So after 1907, once all of the merchantable timber in the province appeared to be under license, they ceased issuing these. Uh, <coughs> foresters who were starting to get, one of the interesting uh, things that happens is that you start to get public revenue, which allows you to hire people to administer things. As you hire the administrators, they start saying, we don't like what you're doing, and they start trying to restrain it. And so the creation of the forest branch can be directly tied to these revenues, and the forest branch is one of the groups that wants to stop these licenses from being issued and wants to deal with them. But when you start hiring <coughs> professional foresters, which is what British Columbia is doing, they're no longer thinking about the interests of the Crown. They're thinking about efficient use of the forest resource or proper use of it. How do you do perpetual tree farming? How do you make sure you're conserving through fire suppression and everything else? So the logic of what you want to do is changing from getting revenue to how do you make sure you're managing this resource for the long run. Uh, the other thing that occurs in 1907 is the U.S. financial panic resulted in less demand for timber cutting options generally. So once the financial panic sweeps the United States, no one wants to buy these things anymore because lots of people have been wiped out. So this is a pretty important one that's heading towards the founding of the Federal Reserve System in the United States to deal with uh, some of the bank runs and things like that. How do you manage gold standards versus floating? But British Columbia is part of the narrative because they were selling assets through that boom. And after 1907, that's done. And then after 1912, when the forest branch comes in, they do use what they call the modern system of timber sales to dispose of the rights up front. Uh, and again, they're going to go to shorter duration periods with which you can hold the rights because they want to also get it into the hands of people who will cut the timber. In 1915, there were still 13,747 licenses of good standing. 12,851 were made renewable in perpetuity when the option was offered. And by 1984, sorry, 1944, 2,850 licenses were still in force, representing 20% of the originally alienated acreage. So it's quite a lasting effect of this two-year uh, policy. You give away the cutting rights, and it takes a long time for them to be de extinguished. So the next thing we move to is we want to know, is this a good policy or not? Personally, I would have been happy starting with the cool story, but uh, you often get pushed, okay, what's the punchline here? So we want to think about uh, did doing this policy to get earlier revenue collection, did it help or hinder the province's long-run development or management of the forest reserves? And so the straw man I've been trying to build up is that the Royal Commissions much later, economists and historians, all feel that this period of time, 1905 to 1907, was a big mistake that cost the province, and they've been working hard to undo the damage. So we're going to try and turn that on its head and say, well, let's think about what it was actually doing from the details of the contracts that were being issued and the actual timing of what was occurring. So if we think about what land policies <coughs> have been about in Canada from very early on, and in British Columbia in particular, Land policy since the 1860s were to balance three goals. The first was raise some money for the government, the treasury. Second was to encourage productive use of the land and natural resources for economic development. And third was limit speculative activity on public lands. So one interpretation prior to 1905 is the land policy was doing a lot to limit speculation to encourage productive use of the resource, but in return they got very little revenue. In 1905, the government seems to say enough's enough. They abandoned limiting three to get more of this, and the argument is they killed off two. So if you can't have it. It's sort of like one of those terrible triangles. You can't achieve all three at once. You're trying to find a balance. Early governments were too strong on one and on two, but they didn't get anything from one. And then when they relaxed three, they got lots of revenue, but they killed off number two. Seems to be the argument coming in. And so this is the tension that we saw even around Ed Stelmack's royalty regime. If you raise the royalties, you'll, capital will flee, you'll stifle the industry, and you won't get any revenue anyway. So there's all kinds of arguments about what you're allowed to do with these things. Um, so according to the critics of this era, it's a chronically cash-strapped BC government that abandoned its principles of good governance and allowed the speculators in. And there's a book by Kale. I think it's 1963 or 71, that's a history of BC land policy. You just don't get theses written like that anymore. And these things are great to read, but 
he's looking at it from the idea of an optimal land policy for a, a resource dependent economy and he is highly critical of this the special timber license era because it doesn't fit with what he considers to be the normatively best land policy so one of the things uh, Data is very scarce over this period of time, so I have to use pictures from the Royal Commissions. Uh, special timber license generated a lot of revenue when there was not a lot of timber cutting. So on this graph, starting in 1912 and going to 1943, this is from the 1945 Royal Commission, the lower part of these bars is what you get from rental payments on the standing timber from the special timber licenses. This is five years after they were no longer issued. The hatched area is the royalty from cutting, and this top area is the upfront uh, revenue from land sales or timber sales. So what you can see is that for a long time, it's really the rental payments that's generating a lot of revenue. And then by the 1920s, you start to get more cutting as they're finally getting demand for the timber. It's only by the time you're in the 1920s that royalties match what you're getting from rentals. And so what you're thinking about is you're taking revenue from the future with these rentals and moving up front because the fear was what these guys were doing is they're competing with your land sales. So when the government goes to sell timber cutting rights to a timber cutter, the timber cutter can negotiate with the government or they can go and negotiate with these guys. So then the view would be that this green area, which is revenue from timber sales, that could have been much higher if you didn't have this problem of timber cutters having the ability to go and negotiate with these guys. And so over time the story is income from rentals declines, royalties increases and land sales increases. But they're still heavily reliant on royalties at the time of cutting. And so this is where the industry is shifting into then thinking about should we use tree farm licenses and longer uh, property rights to get the investment in things like silviculture and tree planting. But early on basically this grab in revenue would be considered to be at the expense of land sale revenues in the future. That's what you're giving away by doing this. So in 1904, forest revenues, when they, when they eventually reached 2.8 million in 1908, that's 80% from STL rentals. By 1910, less than 10% of British Columbia land had been surveyed, which means no one's going to be cutting in the foreseeable future. Uh, because surveying was, and cruising was required uh, for harvest to occur and BC lumber production was only 20% of Canadian production at this time. So the, what I'm trying to highlight is they're making money from forests at a time when they're really not producing any timber. And when you tout the Staples thesis for 20 years, 25 years like me, this is a problem because we've always taught natural resource exports generate economic growth. Well, this is a case where we have a Staples episode with no resource production. And so that's a really neat thing too, but again, there's no market for those papers either. Because um, <laughs> now we all believe in the resource curse, which uh, someday they'll discover the hoteling model of resource production again, and that literature will go away too. We had trouble publishing that one as well. Um, revenues are two and a half times those of any other province and half of the forest revenues from all provinces. So in other words, I'm trying to just make a point. The scale of revenue they're generating by doing this is not a marginal thing. They have suddenly got a lot of money for a small population. And so it becomes interesting to think about, did this revenue grab cost them in the long run, or did they manage to do something productive with it? And then forest revenues for British Columbia went from 20% of all provincial revenue to about half, by the 1940s, for example, forest revenues are only less than 15% of total government revenues. So again, if you think about a high reliance of a government on uh, non-natural resource revenue, this is an incredibly resource-dependent government in this early period. And they've got a lot of revenue, even in contrast to other provincial governments in Canada. So how this policy has missed the eye of public finance economists, I don't know. Because if you're generating this much revenue, you'd think that that would be interesting to study in and of itself. But because it was so brief, I think everyone just left it alone. And because no one cares about regional economics, they don't look at what's happening in provinces. They like to talk about what's happening with the feds, what's happening feds versus provinces. But again, there's got to be tons of these examples where governments are trying to do novel things and actually getting some money out of it. Now, critics argue that these licenses changed the timing of revenue collection 
but sacrifice total potential forest revenue. So we're going to assess this by doing a counterfactual calculation. What we're going to do is say, let's suppose that the STLs had never happened. Let's suppose that we just did this from the period of time when the timber is actually in demand. Should they have just waited? Uh, what would the value have been of the revenue they collect? So the idea here is that in 1907, we're going to have perfect foresight and we're going to borrow against future rents to give us a net present value. So in other words, we know what the future looks like. We're going to take realized prices, realized sales and volumes uh, from 1925 on. And we're going to say that in 1907, we saw that coming and we issued bonds against it, risk-free. And so that's going to give us an asset value of the standing timber under the counterfactual timber sales versus special, uh, special timber licenses. Does that kind of make sense? So what we're going to say is that... Uh, if we're going to use 1925 and 1947 and 1956 as three times when the timber stands could have been cut. And so the idea is uh, if I issue, if I sell you a timber license in 1925, you have 10 years to cut the timber. So we're going to collect the revenue over a 10 year period on that square mile of land. And in 1947, we'll issue a 10 year period to cut on that one. And we're going to use realized land sale values from those years just to make, take account of what it would have been. In, the year they were going to be cut, not in 1907. And then we want to acknowledge that there's going to be uh, no rental payments under the counterfactual for the years where there's no cutting, so you give up that revenue. But there's no difference in royalties collected under special timber license or this counterfactual because the government never gave up the rights to royalties. So when we do this, what you find out is that the net present value and constant purchasing power of timber cut in 1925 uh, I think this is per square mile, is a buck seventy nine per year, and the, or sorry, buck seventy nine in net present value. Whereas for the special timber license rental stream, you get two twenty nine. So in the earlier timber, you're definitely further ahead with the rentals over the special timber licenses. And then for 1947, it's only fifty four cents per licensed area versus two seventy four. So even on a, a stand that's going to be produced in the future, if you could book those rents in the present, you're still collecting a lot more revenue through the special timber license over the long run. So from this perspective, there's no sacrifice in revenue being made. In fact, it's revenue increasing for the crown by creating this stream. And the other thing to remember is that this is collected on every stand, whether it's cut or not, whereas this one is only collected on cut stands. So the extensive margin is now you're even getting a bigger volume of revenue as well as a more intensively harvested rent per acre. So in other words, this is an incredible money maker for the Crown, even if they're giving up on timber sales. And by moving the timing up, they're collecting a lot of that money up front. So they get more revenue, so now the critics shift course. Of course, they don't know that they collected more revenue because we just did this. But let's suppose we just say, let's give them another argument. So they argue inefficient management of timber resources resulted from this. So this is what's alleged when you read the, special, the uh, Royal Commissions in the media back in the early 19th century. Special timber licenses resulted in too slow a pace of cutting is one claim. Speculators hindered legitimate timber cutters and mill operators from getting access to the timber they wanted. They had to negotiate with multiple sellers who demanded too high price for the cutting rights. And what's happening is there's actually a spe timber speculators association that lobbies the BC government for things like the perpetual renewal of the license. There's also uh, lobbying groups representing timber cutters. And so they're both making claims that, no, they're doing good things, they're doing bad things, but there is an actual political debate going on about these licenses and what the government should do about them. The second argument was that special timber licenses resulted in too rapid cutting. So we have too slow on the one hand, and then another group's going to argue it's too rapid. Speculators with too high a rental uh, payment and nearing the end of the license renewability would liquidate en masse, depressing the timber market. And so this argument carried the day with the BC government, and that's why they went to perpetual renewal. That they were actually worried the licenses caused too rapid depletion, whereas the mill operators are claiming it's resulting in too slow and you're stifling the industrialization of the province. Um, in the Royal Commission in 1909-1910, one of the interesting things that was discovered is that there was no map showing where any of these claims were. 
So they didn't actually know what had been staked, and when they finally got around to it and looked at it, they found there were all kinds of overlapping stake claims, and in fact, multiple licenses issued on the same claim, which would have been interesting to deal with. And then there were areas too that were just missed completely because you literally have these these blind spiders going all over the province just staking things and running back to Victoria, and probably in a few cases they never actually went out. <laughs> they just went, <laughs> just went out. And anyone who could read a map with latitude and longitude could probably figure out you could pick a square mile and go and register it. And who's going to go out and check your stakes? So the, the possibility of fraud is potentially in here. Um, the other thing is that the asset value of the idle resource is declining. And this was a big fear of the Forest Service after 1912. The biggest problem when you have mature forest is fire. And so what you find is that the, lo the value that they estimate was lost in fire per year in the interior of BC was equal to what they collected in royalties in the 1940s. And so fire is a big annual loss, and so they want to spend a lot of time, they want to cut the mature forest before it burns to the ground. And so that becomes a big focus, that they don't want people holding these things for a long time. They want to, for reasons of just liquidating the forest assets they have, make sure that people are going to cut. So what's going to come about after 1909-1910 is the proposal from that Royal Commission is that land policy is at odds with scientific management principles promoted by schools of forestry and practices in mature economies. So in other words, at this point, scientific management will replace these crazy revenue-hungry guys, and they're going to start to manage the asset appropriately. And this is where the literature seems to have taken off from accepting that the previous regime was a mistake and what you really needed is knowledgeable foresters to tell you how to optimally manage a resource. And that's how we teach our students today. We don't teach them crazy revenue models in resource economics. We teach them what is the hoteling model, what's the, uh, I always forget the name, Van Toynen is the forest one, or is that the city one? City. City. There's a one for forestry as well that gives you the optimal rotation of trees if you're operating as a farm. Which works great in Europe where you have flat land, not so great in BC where it's a little more rugged. So what was gained? And this is what's been missed in a lot of cases. Premier, or Minister Ross in 1912 noted, this is a great quote again, forest policy let loose the flood of prosperity that the province has enjoyed ever since. Flood of prosperity uh, in Alberta has a different connotation, but uh, after the 2013 flood, I liked all the reports coming out saying that we were going to get a kick in growth in Alberta from rebuilding everything. And when they were actually taking this seriously, we wanted to issue an op-ed pointing out we don't have to wait for floods, we can randomly select neighborhoods for destruction and rebuild them and get the same kick every year if they thought this was good policy. But the flood of prosperity here is just they got this fire hose of revenue coming in and what are they able to do with it? Well, one of the things they knew is that they had some agricultural potential in the interior, but they had to open it up with roads, railroads, surveying and everything else. So when they get the revenue finally after 1907, they can do the surveys. They can construct the roads, the railways and the bridges. So you get this capital investment going on to open up a, what would be called a lateral linkage, which is a new sector not related to forestry. Um, and then the 1909-1910 Royal Commission, they argued you needed a timber branch to manage the resource. How do you pay for a timber branch without the, McDo the special timber license revenues? So in other words, they're able to set up the infrastructure and the administration to do the scientific management, and that still persisted today. It's a really important part of the BC government. Um, and the one that I find uh, most compelling, which I'm still working on with Chris Minns a bit, is that he and Mary McKinnon had a paper showing the expansion of the schooling system in British Columbia after 1900. And the margins they're looking at is the conversion of single-room schoolhouses into multiple-room schools, going to teachers who are not just the local single gal to people who actually have a teaching certificate. Uh, when you get into high schools and going towards secondary education, the timing of it, and I'm not going to say it's causal, but the timing all coincides the expanding the school system coincident with all this increase in revenues. There's no increase in school taxation over that period of time. So it really appears is that all that revenue going into the BC Crown was being used in this kind of investment uh, approach. So they're, they are keeping their tax levels low and things like that, but they're making all of these investments that are going to pay dividends down the road. In particular, this gets them the interior agriculture, this gets them the management of the timber resource, this gives them the human capital formation. And so this is a really important lesson that comes out of this.
So what do we learn? And this is the most exciting slide of any talk, the last one. Thank you. Oh, even have time at the end. Exports of natural resources are not necessary for growth in a small open economy. In other words, if there's an asset value, governments that are creative can figure out ways, including borrowing against future revenues, to figure out how to take advantage of a future autonomous shift in demand for its resources. So in other words, when we think about resource-rich economies that aren't quite ready to produce, they can actually take advantage of the fact that companies might want to come in and invest, and if they're smart, they can extract some of those rents to use for their own uses. And so if you think about mineral-rich developing economies today, if the governments could figure out how to write a contract to sort of get some of the asset value up front, then that would give them some of the resources to make the investments that people like uh, Jeffrey Sachs, uh, William Easterly, and others think would be useful for developing uh, some of the African economies. And so production and export are only just one way to convert natural wealth into financial wealth. So we can get more creative. Um, and then the troubling one for the course I'm teaching is I keep telling them natural resource exports are necessary for Staples development. I'm trying to figure out how I'll change that lecture or if I can just stop teaching it. <laughs> uh, successful resource development comes from saving and investing the resource rents. This is the tragedy of Alberta because we will not learn this lesson since, well, Lahi tried to do this. To his credit, our most recent premier, of course, says we all need to look in the mirror because we didn't want them to save, so it's our fault. Um, but if you don't save the resource rents, you're not going to overcome the fixed costs of industrialization to get your manufacturing, which is Sachs and Warner, right before they did the resource curse. You're not going to get the investment in human capital that we know leads to good things in the long run. And you're not going to invest in the institution structures and capacity to manage the resource and the rents generated when demand does emerge. So you have to be able to use these rents when you get them in a productive way, not just to kind of uh, have a big party and then when it's over everyone leaves which is unfortunately what Alberta keeps trying to do. Uh, historians also need to respect the degree to which early governments understood finance and market conditions. That was one of the more remarkable things as I started reading historians' interpretation of this period and then going back to the 1910 Royal Commission and seeing the detail in the financial calculations. The Kale book suggests these guys didn't have a clue how to add two and two together. And it really comes out that Kale didn't understand how to assess net present value and what they meant when they said, suppose you could issue bonds against the future rents. And they actually had detailed sensitivity scenarios to show you what the different revenue streams would have been under uh, different timing of the issuance of licenses. So the present is focus that we have in universities on efficient management of a resource may fail to recognize pragmatic motives for trade-offs that governments are going to make. And so even when we go to advise government on how should we be managing something like the oil sands, if our focus is solely on efficient management of the resource, it might mean that we're not actually taking full account of social welfare. That if you can live with some inefficiency in managing the resource, but extract more rent from the producer and use that rent productively, then maybe you're going to have a bigger long-run benefit. But you know that the industry always fights back with you need a royalty system that promotes efficient management, which typically means they shouldn't pay much royalty at all. And so this is where uh, I think the McBride era, because there were no producers to cloud the debate, <laughs> you can get a different perspective on it. But that's all I have for this talk. I'm happy to take questions or speculate about things with Alberta.